Managing Violence Podcast, Season 4, Episode 2, with Guru Raymond Floro. to another episode of the Managing Violence Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Saunders, and today I am joined by a legend of the Australian martial arts, Mr. Raymond Floro. I've known Ray for many years, and he is, without a doubt, one of the world's leading experts in edged weapons and improvised weapons. And uh, today we get into a little bit of Ray's story about how he uh, came up in the martial arts in Australia. He's a Filipino martial artist, born in the Philippines, but didn't start training until he got here. And uh, his journey to rediscovering Filipino martial arts when no one knew what it was uh, and how he went about combining Filipino martial arts with fencing and boxing to create fluoro fighting systems and uh, and also a little bit of advice on uh, the use of improvised weapons if you're working or living in non-permissible environments where the carriage or use of uh, deliberate weapons is frowned upon. There's a lot in this episode. Ray's a fantastic guy. He's a smiling assassin. You'll hear his voice, you'll see his face, and you'll think this is not a dangerous man. But having sparred with him and being hit in the head a lot by Ray Floro, uh, I can testify he is one of the most deceptively dangerous human beings on the planet. Before we get to Ray, I need to give a quick shout out to our newest Patreon subscribers. We have Michael Mascaro, who has signed up to be a Keeper of the Fire. Thank you very much, Michael. And also Mr. Emmett Martin, who is actually a student of uh, Jim Armstrong's. And uh, Emmett has signed up to be part of the Tribal Council. As such, Emmett will get bonus content if you would like to hear the bonus content from last week's show or from this week's show or from any future show. Make sure you head over to patreon.com forward slash managing violence and sign up to either the Tribal Council or tribal, tribal Elders. For just $5 or $10 a month, you will receive tons of bonus stuff, which is all really, really cool. Of course, I would say that though, because hey, it's my stuff. And uh, that's about it. All right, let's get into Ray as soon as we pay some bills. This episode is brought to you by R2S Academy. If you're after premium e-learning courses in topics such as occupational violence prevention, security and safety awareness, behavioral observation and suspicious activity recognition, active armed offender management, fire safety and evacuation, stressful situation response, resilience building, and, uh, well, so many more. Check out the full range of pre-built courses at www.r2s.academy. But that's not all. R2S Academy are learning design specialists and have built tailored risk, security, and emergency courses for companies and government entities in Australia and around the world. For more information, check out www.r2s.academy. And if you'd like 10% off your purchase, enter the coupon code JOEMVP. That's J-O-E-M-V-P. Check it out now. www.r2s.academy. All right. Thanks for joining us on the show, mate. It's been a, been a little while since we've had a, a conversation. It's good to finally do it and to be able to record it for posterity as well. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, a pleasure to be invited, Joe. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it has, it's been way too long, mate. We've been meaning to catch up for years and it just hasn't materialized as yet. But, uh, yeah, all good things will happen eventually. But um, just for the sake of listeners that might not know about you, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a rundown in the, in the intro, but I'd really like to know your story. Yeah. I, I think I only know elements like little pieces of your story that you've dropped over the years in different interviews. So, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got started in martial arts, and sort of go through your journey a little bit? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Martial arts. I've always been interested in martial arts. The funny thing is, I was the only one in my family who was ever interested in that. Started off when I was nine years old, and the only martial arts school around at that time um, was karate, karate or judo. So I started with Goju Kai with. Uh, uh, the master Paul Starling, and we still keep in contact, funnily enough, which is great. But I was with him for a few years, but even since then, my affinity uh, steered towards weapons. I don't know why, it must be in the blood, must be genetics, but uh, I like sticks and knives. Now, there was no uh, Filipino martial arts at that time that I could find in Australia. In fact, I didn't even know there was Filipino martial arts. So. And the only resource I had was martial arts world up in Gladesville. And uh, I went over there and I found this book, uh, this pink book 
uh, the, by Remy Pressas. And I actually thought it was a Chinese art, so I bought that. And there was another red book called uh, Secrets of Modern Knife Fighting by David Steele. Now, that one I loved because it was on knives. And I, at, at the age of nine, I just like knives. So I bought that. Um, and it said in that book that uh, you know, to learn knife fighting, there wasn't any schools around at that time. Um, I mean, I'm turning, 50, I'm turning 57 now, so do the math. This was when I was nine years old. And they said that you know, to, to practice knife fighting, you should do fencing, foil fencing and saber fencing, uh, which I did. And um, so I, I, I kind of gave up karate. I did that for, I think, three years. And I started fencing, and I became quite good at it. Uh, I, I won a couple of um, state championships, but this is only C or B grade. But after that, and that was through high school, after that, I found out there was Filipino martial arts. Now, with the Filipino martial arts, we kind of do it in reverse. Rather than learning hand-to-hand -hand first, the more you graduate to the black belt, then you do weapons. That's, that's a traditional style. Um, we start off with weapons first. As the better you get, the weapons get short until it becomes knife, until you get better until it becomes empty hand. So now here's the problem. There was no martial arts, uh, no Filipino martial arts school around that I knew of. And even my parents didn't know what, you know, a nis was, was a screamer was, or what Kali was. Um, and there's the quandary. Hence, there was this book by Remy Pressas on modern Anis, and I only had that to go on. So between fencing and that uh, Remy Pressas book, Secrets of, Modern Knife, uh, 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 Secrets of Modern Knife Fighting, and the Remy Pressas book, Modern Anis, I kind of mucked around with, uh, not only with swords, with foils, but with sticks. So just to, just, to, uh, just to interject there, just for, because um, I think this is a, it, it's an interesting misconception. So I mean, you, you're Filipino, you're born in, born in the Philippines, your parents are Filipino. And yes. none of you had even heard of Kali or Anis or a screamer. Uh, and I think we... None of my family, none of my uncles, aunties, yeah. nobody. I think I think Western martial artists tend to have this idea that you know, if you go to the Philippines, it's it's kind of like going to Thailand, wherever yeah, you know, everywhere you go, there's Thai boxing. It's it's not quite like that with the Philippines. Exactly. Martial arts. I mean, even now, if, even now, I mean, I'm all over YouTube. Every, most people know me. Even now, my friend says, "Oh, how's your karate going?" <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, we've got our own style. We've got our own Filipino style. You're still calling it karate. He goes, how's your karate going? Like, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's the quandary, you see. There's the quandary. And at that time, when I was a teenager, there was nothing on weapons. The only other two books, and uh, I think somebody asked me a question once, was what's your favourite book? Well, my favourite book was Secrets of Modern Knife Fighting by David Steele. Um, which is, funnily enough, is not really a very good instructional on knife fighting, but it got me, that's what got me started. Now, I also love the book by, um, Cold Steel by uh, John Styers. Now, that's a United States Marine Corps manual that was, you know, way in the 40s, World War II stuff. And in that had basic knife fighting, bayonet fighting, unarmed fighting, and stick fighting. And I based that with the fencing and another book called uh, Get Tough by William Fairbairn that had a little bit of stick fighting. And with those books, with my training in fencing, that was the origins of fluoro fighting systems. Yeah, so that's now, I could have done, yes. You yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because um, I, I kind of assumed that, um, that your origins of, of fluoro fighting systems actually came out of um, yeah, traditional studies of Filipino martial arts, but it's actually the opposite. It, it was, it was uh, Frankenstein from the beginning. Yeah, that's correct, correct. Uh, the Filipino martial arts was the last thing. It was the, <laughs> the very last thing. Because you've got to understand there was, no, there was no good Filipino martial arts here for a long, long time. For a long, long time. So yeah, and what I did was, uh, see, with the karate, I, I wanted to learn the nun chaku and the tansa, you know, being influenced by Bruce Lee, of course. But I had to get to Brown Belt to do that, and it was just too far, too long. 
with the fencing, it's great, but fencing is great for building attributes. Uh, but the techniques itself is more sport rather than combat. So I had to learn from books. And remember, YouTube, social media, nothing like that existed. Video, VHS, VHS tapes didn't exist. Um, I remember the Panther Productions and things like that came in much later. And I bought, you know, the Dan and the Santo videos, the Burton Richardson videos, and, you know, there's a Tony Blower panic attack, all that. Then I started buying those. Oh, yeah, Paul Vunak. Um, his tapes were fantastic. I still think his tapes are good. Those were my instructors. Now, uh, for years I did that, and I had a handful of students. I called them the Garage Boys. And uh, all we did was spar and spar hard. Now, that was the time that uh, the Dog Brothers were coming out. That had a heavy influence. And remember, there's nothing around, so we just bought the videotapes and we tried to mimic them. Uh, so that was the, the training. Now, so it happened that one day my auntie said, oh, you know, uh, was that Anissi or Arthur? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, I, I, know, I, know, I know a person who does it, uh, Tony Dedal. Uh, who was a friend. So I went to him every week and he taught me in his backyard, never charged me a cent. I think he just died recently, unfortunately. And he taught me his version of uh, Palintawa, which is, a, which is a close quarter style of uh, Filipino martial arts. And that was great. I was pig in mud, but it was very basic. Now, a guy called Ray Galang uh, invited... Christopher Ricketts, Tony Diego, and Edgar Solite to Australia to do a master's uh, seminar, uh, which I went to because Tony Dadal was invited, but he didn't want to go. So I said, oh, look, you know, go to this guy. They've got some you know, masters from the Philippines coming. And so I did. And, you know, and that was when I discovered my martial arts because Edgar Solite did La Meco and Lameco, uh, I'm 11th ranked in the world uh, with Lameco. I don't teach it uh, as often. I'm more Carlos Strissimo, but there's that. Tony Diego was um, Carlos Strissimo, so I learned from him. And, and, and Christopher Ricketts was Carlos Strissimo and his style of uh, martial arts called Sagasa. Anyway, with those three, they took me under their wings, fortunately, and then introduced me to the great man, Grandmaster Antonio Tatango Strisma, in the Philippines uh, when I went there. Now, my father worked at Qantas, so we got cheap airfare. So every, this was high school days, so every school holidays, we'd go to the Philippines. And every day I would train with uh, Grandmaster Illustrissimo, with Tony Diego, with Edgar Solita, with Master Ronnie Macapagal and Christopher Ricketts. What they would do is um, they would come to my grandmother's place and they'd spend the whole day and whole evening with me for, from our stay. So sometimes they'd take it in shifts. In the morning or daytime, half of them would come in. Then in the evening, they'd go and they'd switch shifts. So in, in actual fact, the, the home of Carlos Illustrisa is Luneta Park in the Philippines. But nobody there knows me because I never really went there to hang out with them. Because the masters went to my grandmother's place and they taught me their one on Imagine having like four or five masters giving you private lessons for hours, for weeks, yeah, for it's years. incredible. What an incredible experience. Yeah, it was just great. And you'll see a lot of the video now of the old man and Edgar or Tony where there's a garden backyard setting. That was my grandmother's place. Wow. <laughs> So, and, and that was it. That, 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 that was it. Uh, that's, that's how I started. That's how I progressed. And, uh, and I'm here. But the, the, now, the, now, when I was learning, um, interject if you have any questions, okay? Please, please interject. Now, when I was training, uh, it was really hard learning from the old man because he kind of spoke six dialects in the same sentence. And I only know basic Tagalog. But... He, he would kind of waddle along and he would stand in front of you and, okay, I'm ready for my lesson. And you'd look at each other and nothing. 
I, I'd learn now if people, and the, the other guy says, no, no, ask him a question. Ask him, oh, okay. So then you'd go, okay, uh, Tang, that's what I call him, Tang, short for Tata. I said, Tang, what happens if you do this? So you feed him a, an angle number one. And then he'd move, okay, what would happen if you do this? And he goes, okay, you do this. And he, he, all you see is this flurry. And then you'd go, okay, can I see that again? Because you didn't see it. And you'd feed the same technique. And then he'd do another flow, but it was completely different. I'm thinking, wait a minute. All right, can, all right, can I see it again? And you feed that, and he'd do something completely different. So he would never do the same thing twice. Now, the thing is, because of that, uh, what, what we figured out was when you started asking him questions, he will stand there with his sword down. So you would feed an angle and he would react from his sword down. Now he would finish that move now with his sword pointing up. When you say, okay, can I see that move again? He won't reset to where he started, but he will continue where he is already. So you can tell he's a fighter. Mm. Like he won't reset. So it was hard. After a while, you found out what moves were by the angle and how where he started now my learning from him was different when because because it was one-on-one -on -one, i asked him look i don't want to learn the entire system i really don't what i want to learn is what you use when you fight all the time and he goes oh that's easy so my entire learning from him was focused on what he used in combat scenarios now, as it is, I, I learned the entire, because I was with him for a few years, I, I eventually learned the whole thing. But every time he veered away and showed me fancy, fancy, I said, no, 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 that's fancy. Let's stick to what really was. Oh, okay. And, and that's it. And I've carried out that philosophy for my entire career of focusing on what works, focusing on what you use in combat and nothing else. That's really interesting, actually. I remember training with um, an instructor in, in Brisbane, and uh, he had grown up in the Philippines learning, uh, learning, learning uh, Kali there. And uh, he said that he had an experience where uh, he was you know, a black belt student, for lack of a better term, um, and his instructor yeah. went to the US uh, to start teaching. Yeah. And, and uh, a couple of years later, yeah. came back and, uh, and was in a panic because his American students were coming to, coming to the Philippines. And he had been teaching right. all this fancy stuff um, to try and keep their attention more or less uh, because they're not getting into real fights on a regular basis. So he'd sort of commercialized his system. And now he was coming back to the yeah. Philippines and had to rapidly get his black belts up to speed on what, all this new stuff that, that he had said was part of the system. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. All, these, all these guys that had been learning basics and were very, very good fighters now had to learn all these flourishes and, uh, and fancy stuff so that the Americans wouldn't realize they'd been deceived. <laughs> So. No, 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 it's, 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 it's so true. I, you know, the biggest example of that was uh, when I was learning with Edgar Solite. Now, like I'm a, 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 an equivalent of third Dan in the Lameco system, but I don't teach it uh, for the simple reason um, being that the Lameco system has a defining moment where it completely changed. I always call it pre-Dan and Santo, post-Dan and Santo. Now, when I, I, with the Lameco I learned was pre Dan and Santa, meaning everything I learned was when Edgar Salite was living in the Philippines. All right. Now, the Lameco system was simple. It was two sets of 12 drills. So that's 24 drills in total um, of certain uh, way of manipulating the stick, which was very effective uh, in fighting and especially tournaments. Um, in, in fact, at that time, Senator Miguel Zubiri was the national champion of the Philippines. Who, and there's a video of me sparring him. And he used a lot of those Lameco drills to win the national champions. But anyway, it was a very simple system. It was like 24 drills, disarms, and footwork, and you know, flow drills. That's it. Then uh, he moved to the USA. Now, when he moved to the USA, he actually became one of Dan and Asanto's instructor. And what happened there, I guess, to cater for the American market, the entire system turned into two mandrels. And, and that's, that's, and I don't know any of those two mandrels. That's why I don't teach it, because the Lameco I, I, I know is not the Lameco it is today. 
Now, I, I, there's nothing wrong with two-man drills, but I don't like doing it. Uh, number one, I'm left-handed. A lot of those drills got to be right on right, and I just, I just hate that. I hate being told to use my right hand. Um, I mean, last week, uh, Foxtel Studios rang me. They asked me to audition for a, a Marvel movie that's coming up. And I went there, and for an entire hour, we had to do these Filipino martial arts drills. But I had to do, do it one uh, right-handed. Every, which I, I did it, but I hated it. Okay, And I think if all you do is drilling, it doesn't prepare you to proper sparring or proper fighting because the distance is wrong, meaning you're too close. You have to be close because you're feeding from each other, giving or taking. And the timing is all wrong because when you're flow drilling, you want to get into a rhythm. Whereas with fighting, you want to break that rhythm. Uh, so it, it, to me, uh, two-man drills in what I do develops actually bad habits rather than promote good habits. Yeah, actually, interesting. I was just talking to Matt Larson, um, who's a director of combatives at West Point in the US, and uh, he was yeah. he was sort of saying the same thing about boxing and, and doing too much pad work, and that you get used to feeding yeah. combinations where you know it's it's you know, jab jab cross left hook duck under come back up with an uppercut whatever the combination is, and you see boxes that yeah. are trained in in a certain sequence. Uh, so frequently that they, they end up ducking under a blow that didn't even come in the real fight because that that's just the muscle memory or the the um, that's the cue for when that jab lands they throw the jab then the right cross then the left hook then the duck under. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and and like you say, I mean, you practice those drills, you get into a certain rhythm, and it's like a timing thing. Whereas you're you're not actually yeah, yeah. You get, into, you get into rhythm, you get into timing, and you become predictable. You you, be, you become predictable. Whereas um. The, the way is the way the the old uh, the, you, know, you don't you don't see the rhythm. It's it's always broken rhythm, and that's what sparring does. You see, that's what sparring does. You're trying to break the rhythm all the time, and to me, the most important thing is distance and timing. Uh, with drilling, your distance is wrong. You're too close. Yeah, I mean, you've sparred me. You, you see how far. Yeah, I, think I, that's far I, think, I think I think calling that sparring was fairly generous. You beat me up for two days. <laughs> I'll link the video of that in the in the show notes if you want to see me as a however old I was, twenty one or twenty two, getting uh, beat up by by forty something Ray Flora as he giggles at me the whole time. You're, you're not the only one. They, they all go through that. <laughs> I know. I quite I quite enjoy when other people go, videos as well. I love is, it's, it's just you all go through that. I'm just amazed. It's just it's. It's just amazing that you just use one or two techniques, you, you, just basic techniques, and you, you, you have a command of the distance, you have a command of the timing and the broken rhythm. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Fancy. And that's what the old man told me. When you look at the old man, he just does an upwards, upwards, and, downwards stri upwards and downwards strike all the time. But because he's changing his kind of body angle, he's changing the kind of distance by leaning in, leaning out, or moving his back foot out, or just hesitating before he continues, that's all you need. That's what, that's what I love about weapons. You can have one or two techniques and dominate. Uh, yeah. You don't need thousands of techniques. And, and I think that that's, that's something that um, in the years that, that have gone by since I, since I first trained with you and I've uh, watched plenty of videos of your, your movement, I, I remember the the first time I sparred with you, I just couldn't understand how you were so fast. So, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, look, I, I look at you, I'm like, well, you know, he's 40 something at that time. It, he's not a great athlete. Like it's nothing physically like no, you're better athlete than abnormal. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why is he so fast? And it took me a long time to figure it out that, it was just that you, you were so precise with not telegraphing anything. And as you said, the timing was off, the distance was off. You're never where I wanted you to be. And I never knew when you were about to move. And um, having, yeah, you know, the, the sparring I've done. Yeah, you, everything you said there is the secret to it. The yeah. secret is not speed. The secret is I did not telegraph. The secret is I disrupted your rhythm. 
and uh, and 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 I make and I made my body look like it's going at one angle, where in fact I'm hitting you in a different angle. Yeah, that, and, and that's uh, it. That's it. Like uh, like Bruce Lee, like he he was fast, like physically fast. But the reason he was so fast was not because he moved fast, because he moved first. He, he he anticipated and he intercepted and it made it look like he was lightning fast when he was obviously he was a good athlete as well but it was his he was uh, his initiation speed and the timing that he could that he could use to close distance and to and to uh, pick up on subtle cues to intercept techniques that made him so incredibly you know <laughs> hard to deal with I guess in yeah, this sparring context absolutely and and, and that is the the essence of jikinder jikinder the way of the intercepting fist now fencing has that 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 uh, concept. It's called a stop hit. It's when you're just about to prepare an attack, I beat you to it. In fencing, that's a stop hit. And if you, lo- if you watched Way of the Dragon, uh, that is, to me, the movie where Jeet Kune Do is absolutely illustrated. Uh, if you watch Way of the Dragon, you'll see that his opponent will start an attack and he'll beat him to it. That, that's it's it's that that's that concept you're talking about by intercepting. Now with the old man, um, you see him that his opponent will strike, and he will actually strike at the same time, but in the middle of the strike he'll angle it so that his opponent misses him, but he will connect uh, at the opponent's hand. So th- that's again the essence of the stressima. So let's let's um, talk a little bit about you developing your own system. So obviously you you had this masterclass um, happening in the in the Philippines while, while you're on holidays. So yes. what what happened yes. from there that, that led to you developing your own sort of flavor? Yeah, no, just good question. Okay, so I, I met the old man. Um, actually, previous to meeting the old man, uh, the other masters they kept talking about. Oh, you know, uh, when when my grandmaster was stressing me, when when the old man was when Tata moves. He just goes up and down, nothing else. Uh, all you see is a down struck and up to strike. Now, from then, I thought, I love that simplicity. And then I finally met him. I, I didn't immediately introduce myself. I was just watching him. And sure enough, he was just hitting up and down, up and down, up and down. If you look at videos of him on YouTube, it'll just be up and down, up and down, up and down. And I'm thinking, I love that simplicity. And I promised myself, I am going to be that simple. Now, with fencing, I think it started off with fencing. There are, I don't know, five parries and several attacks. But I concentrated on uh, one attack, like a fake and disengage. One attack, and I did it well. And I concentrated on two parries. That's it. My entire profession, I specialize in this one attack and these two defenses. And I won all my tournaments with it, you see. So I wanted to bring that over to my martial arts. So, so in essence, at any one time, my system will only have about, say, eight moves to it. Now, I, go, I try to go to every seminar. I try to train with everyone. I try to inspire everyone so that I can learn and find something that's better. Now, when I, so I've got those eight moves. I go around, I meet instructors. Now, if I find somebody better and or if I see a move that's really good, I won't add it to my system. I will replace something. So, for example, I, I find this move. I said, geez, that's a good move. Now, okay, I'm going to adopt that move. All right. What in my existing arsenal will I give up to replace it with this technique? And that takes a lot of thinking. Because you've got your favorite move that's worked for you all the time. Now you see this move that you think, you know what, this is a good move. Rather than add it, okay, I'm going to replace one of my favorites with this. Now that makes you think a lot about the moves. That makes you practice it a lot inspiring. Yeah, I love that. It's it's like rather than collecting, curating. Yeah, if it's really that good, you will replace it. But then you start thinking, oh, you know what? It's good, but this one kind of still edges it. I'll keep it. So don't get me wrong. It's it's inside my you know my memory castle. It's inside my bank, but it's not a technique I'll focus on. Now I'll develop it a bit more to the stage where you know what I will replace one of my techniques, or you know what I'll still keep my eight, but I still keep the eight techniques, eight concepts, and that that's how I've done. 
I've done it all my professional life. And everything is focused on sparring. It's very rare that you get a lesson of, of me that we don't spar. In, in fact, if you're a student that doesn't like sparring, you won't last with me because I just don't know how to teach you. I don't know how to teach you without sparring. Yeah, and, and look, there. Oh, I've, I remember seeing that video of you just recently sparring with somebody and uh, <laughs> were, you, were you on a cane as well because you had gout in your foot or something? And, uh, oh. <laughs> and still, he's, he's hobbling, around on, hobbling around on one leg with a cane in his 50s and still beating the, <laughs> the other guy. <laughs> Well, there's still distance and timing, but the only difference there, you draw them in because you can't get them. I, I'm with one of them now, that, that G. Choi, he's one of my representatives in the USA now. He came here, oh, just, just recently, last year, uh, towards the end of last year, and he spent uh, a few days with the intense. Now, I lined up two of my other guys, and he, he just spied constantly. We just round robin it, like we'd exchange, but... You should see him now. You should see how he spars now. It's it's amazing what he picked up in those few days to what he's developed it now. It's the learning curve just exponentially accelerated him, and he, he's looking good. And he's a great representative for me uh, in the U.S. It's only because we and his entire time here. He just sparred. Now, during that sparring, we would make cre um, corrections. Like, okay, your, your hand is wrong. It's too far out. Try to, okay, when you're, when you're doing a strike, you're telegraphing. Try to move your hand first, then your feet, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how I teach. Rather than drilling, I show you the technique. Then you try to apply it through sparring. And then I do make corrections. Now, what happens there is, you move a certain way, I move a certain way, and another person moves a certain way. So I'll allow that throughout sparring, and then I will make corrections. But what happens here, if you take all my students and put it all under the one roof and ask them what to spar, every single one will move, the, will move differently. One will have their left foot forward, right hand back, one will have the right hand forward, right foot forward, one is upright, one is crouched, one's bouncing around, one is like steady as rough, but they're all effective in sparring. So what I do is I try to fit my system to the way you naturally move rather than, you know, you fitting into the system. But that's the luxury I have because I only teach one-on-one -on -one private lessons or small groups. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, you've always been a bit of a quandary in the Australian martial arts community because, <laughs> I mean, uh, he, here's a guy who is, yeah, undisputed one of the world's leading experts in a niche skill. Um, yeah, obviously you do more than just knife, but you've always been the knife guy, right? It's, it's, everyone knows Ray Flores. Yeah, everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's sort of been your calling card. And you're like, well, this guy's trained special forces all over the world. He's been flowing in for this and that. Foxtel's calling him to do Marvel yeah. choreography. Like he, he's, he's a big deal and he's training out of a one car garage. Yeah. Like it's like, what? Yeah. Why? And, and I, I think people would have just, over the years, you have no business sense. <laughs> but I think the quality. I have, no, no, correct. I, 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 have, I have no business sense at all. No business sense. I will die poor. It seems to be the curse of all illustrative masters that they die poor. <laughs> oh, mate, however, I... however, however, yeah. I am fortunate enough that I have other instructors that help me in my career. Like, for example, Melbourne, you've got you know, Paul Veldman, Craig Donaldson. You know, you know, you've got you know, all these people that book me for something. You know, uh, Jody Hardy. And I, I, can, I can write off like 14 people who will host me for seminars. And that, that's where I'm, from a business point of view, that's, that's where I make my money. Like there, there's a guy get called Ray Galea. He follows my entire seminar tour. He's with me and he's my professional meat dummy. And now he's hosting me again. I've, uh, I've got no, Ray's, a, Ray's a listener of the show, so shout out to Ray. Hey, hello. <laughs> looking forward to beating you up. Um, and there's Paul Weatherly, it's, yeah, Paul Weatherly, um, Zendo Kai, uh, Hapkido people, Wing Chun people, um, you know, Alex Say, they, they do uh, Krav Maga. So I've got a, a nice cross section. So it's, it's what you said, I've niched myself really well. But what I do 
weapons will never be a mainstream martial art. It will never be like a Taekwondo, a Karate, a Judo, even BJJ. And people have tried and they failed. I don't know worldwide. It doesn't seem to be a, a, a commercial thing. But I piggyback on other schools. Uh, and other schools would love to put a weapons component into their system, although they don't want to do it full time. Uh, and that's what they do. Um, I've got a guy I, uh, here in Sydney, a giant martial art, uh, Anthony and Giorgio Rapice. Uh, they're lovely people. They do um, Hapkido, a little bit of BJJ, but now they're introducing weapons component, which they're doing extremely successfully. Yeah. Even, even uh, Professor Luke Beston, who's purely BJJ, yeah. He, he, he's, he's introducing the weapon component uh, and they're enjoying it. Yeah, I, so I, I do think, think myself there. I, I, I do think though that um, the, the path you've chosen of, of training people just you know, on your own, one-on-one -on -one, in a private location has enabled you to, to one, have a really good system because you're, you're not focused on how am I going to pay the rent here. Uh, you don't have to worry about right. expanding upon the system to keep for student retention because people are getting bored of the same couple of techniques. You don't have to worry about whether the training's too hard or it's too light or it's yeah. Uh, am I am I incorporating enough MMA or grappling or whatever's whatever's popular at the moment? Like you're not worried about that stuff. Not, you're not distracting yourself with yeah. marketing. You're just a, like I've seen myself just over the last ten or fifteen years, or however long I've known you. Like your system has evolved, but it's always stayed lean and it's it's always stayed such a su such an interesting and dynamic system to learn and the only people that want to learn it <laughs> are people that are probably going to be lifelong or at least very serious martial artists and because of that i think you've got this really nice melting pot of, of expertise that comes in that you get to spar with and I, I i really i think a lot of commercially successful martial artists would envy the the the, uh, the lab that you've got <laughs> and the, and the <laughs> companies you've got. Yeah, absolutely. It's like today, uh, I had jo uh, Anthony Rapice here and we were just doing uh, cane, uh, walking sticks. Now, I haven't mastered that yet. It is such a hard weapon to master. And the entire hour, we just sparred. And um, we were just looking for each other's weaknesses and openings, but that's how I developed my system. You see, Normally in a commercial school, the instructor teaches, but they become stagnant because all they do is show techniques and count one to ten, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or just do the same drills. But the entire hour we were sparring, we were trying to make it better or easier. And you know what? Even up to now, we're still not happy with the system because we can't hit targets at will. I like it. I want it to a stage where if I want to hit you in the head, I'm going to hit you in the head regardless of what you're going to do. <laughs> That's when you know it works. Yeah, I, 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 I think your stuff works <laughs> because you've hit me in the head a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah. the, um, the, the other thing I really like about your system too is uh, I think it, off memory, the first thing I learned from you was, was uh, knife. Uh, and I think I went asking to do um, bare hands against knife because that, I was working in security yeah. and that was probably my, my number one um, thing I wanted to learn. Uh, actually, side note on that <laughs> my main point I, I still am somewhat scarred from the time you pulled the box cutter on me and i thought you're actually trying to stab me that was um that was that was <laughs> it's a learning curve I mean, and, and that's the reality, isn't it? <laughs> well you know what the, the fun thing was like you, you waited until i was doing the technique correctly so i'll paint the picture for for those that I have no idea what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm <laughs> drilling, drilling an, an empty hand knife defense against a, yeah, a training knife. And, uh, and then we progress, I think, to a wooden knife. And then we progress from a wooden knife to, a, um, to the, the blunt steel knife. Uh, and then uh, and the Ray's like, oh, okay, I think you've got it down now. And he pulls out a box cutter and, and, he ex and expands the blade and starts trying to stab <laughs> me. And my brain is going, shit, 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 shit. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm actually... It all goes out the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm actually, I think I actually managed to, to execute the technique. And after I've had a second thinking this crazy old man's trying to kill me, I realized that you'd actually retracted the blade before you tried to stab me just in case. Oh, yeah, safety, safety but, first, yeah, Safety first, you but I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, exactly. It's all mental. Exactly. It's all psychological. But like, and, and the thing is, I wasn't even going full speed. If I was going full speed, it's just, this is where improvised weapons come in. Look, if you want a good unarmed against the knife, look, the people I always turn to is Jerry Wetzel's Red Zone 2. There's Mark Denny's Dog Catcher. 
there's Richard Dimitri Shredder, or there's Burton Richardson's Life Defense for the Street. Those are the four people I always turn to uh, for Unarmed Against a Knife. And I use those, the ones, those things all the time. Um, do I have my own stuff? Yeah, based on their stuff. <laughs> You're also the first guy that told me to that told me case theory, copy and steal everything. I've uh, I've applied that. Case all. theory, copy and steal everything, but give them credit. <laughs> of course, of course. So, um, but yeah, what what I was going to say with that before I got sidetracked with the box cutter was um, that even yeah. even learning your knife and then doing some empty hand with you and doing some stick with you, the the, the gross motors were the gross motor skills were still exactly the same. Yeah, your movement was the yeah. same, the hand position was the same. It was completely interchangeable depending on what you had in your hand. And uh, like I, I still Correct. remember like, some of the some of the uh, boxing stuff that, that I picked up from you that I think you were only just playing with yeah. at the time. Um, but it was so simple. Oh, my boxing now has really really improved. It's it's yeah. I'm happy now. My boxing, I'm happy. I'm happy with my boxing to the extent that my students actually go to um, professional boxing gyms and spar their guys. I, I wouldn't do it, but <laughs> they do it, which is really good. So I, I, I get to test it indirectly through my students. Yeah, yeah. All right, just to, um, just to as we start to heading towards the end of the, the main interview, I want to talk to you a little bit about improvised weapons. So a conversation yeah. that's come up quite often, uh, especially online since I've started this podcast and, and people have started listening, and uh, my listener base yeah. is largely international. So something like last count, about 48% was US, about... 20 something percent is Australia and the rest is, is mostly Europe and then scattered across the rest of the world. Um, yeah. But um, one thing that Americans don't really seem to understand is the legal nature of Australia and that you can't carry a lot of things exactly. uh, to protect, to protect yes. yourself. You can't carry anything to protect yourself um, other than one you can't state. Carry anything. I mean, it's the same in, uh, same in England, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the yeah. law is really strict. Yeah, so I mean, you can't carry anything that is explicitly for self-defense. So knuckle dusters are out, pepper sprays out, batons are out. Uh, even, even carrying Correct. a knife without a purpose, uh, without without an occupational purpose, is out for nearly everywhere in Australia. And Mate, even carry. a Swiss Army knife can get done for. Even yeah. carrying a Swiss Army knife can get done for. I mean, I carry one because it's such a brilliant tool. Okay, as a tool, you, you, but you know, you can kind of explain that. But if you've got like a lock knife, you're done in this country. You're done for. Yeah. So I think for, for those of us that are, um, that are interested in self-defense, there, there's a natural area of exploration of, okay, what can I use in the moment um, that may be on me for any other reason or laying around me? And, and some of your material was just brilliant on that. So do you want to expand on your thoughts on improvised weapons? Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, first of all, any form of weapon is a good equalizer and it's a good force multiplier. I can throw a punch. Okay. I, I can... I can, I can throw a decent punch, but if I've got any form of weapon with improvised, I don't have to throw it as hard or be as accurate, but it'll hit harder. So that's the thing about impact, uh, improvised weapons. It will multiply the force and it will, it's a good equalizer. Now, the obvious ones are keys. Now with the keys, you don't hold it between your knuckles. You, you can't, I kind of pinch it, the key with that's with my thumb and forefinger. It's, it's like you know, it's like you're putting the key in the keyhole, but kind of choke up on it. That's how I do it. Um, pens are good, all right. Uh, obviously, like you know, even the big pens, you get one or two shots out of it. You just got to pick your target properly. Belts are good. Um, a lot of people don't like flexible weapons, but as an initial shield for a knife attack, belts are fantastic. Remembering, if you defend yourself against a knife an arm, that's your arm you're putting in the way of a blade. And you know how that felt when I came at you with a box cutter. But if you've got your T-shirt, a belt, a scarf, a plastic shopping bag, that makes a good shield. Um, I always carry a backpack. Uh, women always have handbags or shoulder bags or things like that. That can be used well. I mean, look at Brad Pitt. He used it against the zombies in World War Z. So he used that. Um, at my age, I'm starting to carry a walking stick, which was great because uh, walking stick or an umbrella is probably the only thing that will come up and defend against a machete or an axe, which is ve a very common weapon with criminals these days. If you look at the news, there's always a machete attack or someone, someone with a hammer or axe. 
Yeah, the, the, intimidation value of, the intimidation value of the large weapons is making them more common. Um, actually, oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> actually, so, side note on that. Um, one thing that I uh, have found somewhat amusing, you remember the, uh, the uh, terrorist incident um, uh, j just recently where uh, the guy ended up being pinned down with in, the- In the street or in Sydney? Uh, in Sydney, where the guy got pinned down with a milk crate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was getting to that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll, get to, we'll get to that one. But what I found before, just to lead into that, um, the guy was yeah stabbing people, and then he was yelling, "Shoot me! Shoot me! Shoot me!" Obviously, he was going for yes. suicide by cop, right? And then a yeah, fire, death by cop, yeah. And then, and then, a, then a, a firefighter grabbed an axe off the um, off the truck and came at him, and all of a yeah, sudden, like, well, he, it was he didn't want to die anymore. Fire. Yeah, like he, he yeah. didn't want to die anymore once there was an axe involved. Like suicide by gunshot seemed <laughs> okay. Suicide by axe didn't seem like such a good deal anymore. So, <laughs> and, then, and then he ran. Let, 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 okay. See, let's expand on it. That, that's such, uh, I was going to get to that, but now that we're here, it's a great example. People always say, oh, why, why do I want to learn weapons? I'll never carry weapons. There'll never be a weapon. True, don't carry weapons. It's illegal. But if you notice in that Sydney incident, the people that controlled and restrained the guy one had a chair, one had a milk crate, one had a fireman's crowbar. They all had improvised weapons. If you look at Flinders Street, that guy that went crazy, um, there was a cop that was using a, a, an ass, you know, expandable baton. He needed more training. But, and, but a shopping cart. <laughs> there was no one who was unarmed that jumped in and controlled and restrained. People who did not have martial arts training, people who were wearing suits going to work, people who were tradies who have never done anything, n never been attacked, never done martial arts before, just picked up what was lying around. I mean, who finds a chair in the middle of the city? Who finds a frigging milk crate in the city street? But anyway, they found it. And what they were actually doing is the, the guy was running around looking for a target and there were, there were passers-by who were oblivious to it. And when this knife guy was approaching uh, uh, an unsuspecting victim, the guys with the chair, the guys with the milk crack would actually run in the middle between the victim and the knife, you know, the knife attacker. And the guy would see them and say, okay, this is too hard. And he will run another direction to find somewhere, someone that's an easier target. So, yeah, there yeah. were people oblivious to what was happening. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point just with the, the improvised weapon. I mean, even if you don't know what you're doing with it, the, the fact that there's something going on, someone picked up an item and it just made them a harder target. Like that, that was, that was it a It made them a harder target and the, and the knife guy didn't engage them. They, he actually kind of ran somewhere else to find a softer target, but those guys followed him around to, to the stage where, guess what, they, they managed to to bring him up. It's a pity that they didn't have a videotape of the actual encounter. Maybe they have, I don't know, maybe it's for evidence, but yeah. I'd love to see that. But well, we did training after that, I managed to get a, a milk crate, I got a, a folding chair, and we did some sparring with it. That milk crate, is, I've got one in the car now. It's <laughs> a good weapon. Okay. Now, you look at... Um, it'll, 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 be, it'll be illegal next year, mate. Don't worry. You won't be allowed to carry a milk crate without a, without a carton of milk in it next year. Mate, ta tactical milk crates, mate. Tactical milk crates. See, look, uh, even that, that book I said, Get Tough, by William Fairbank, he had a chapter on uh, a chair, picking up a chair. And they're such good weapons. The thing is, you may not carry weapons, uh, but you should be aware of what's around you. Okay? Just... For two things, you need to be aware of what's around you so that you can pick something up and protect yourself. You need to be w aware of what's around you just in case somebody picks something up and uses it on you, especially in nightclubs. How many glass things with you know, glass and bottles? See, people aren't mindful of that. It's, it's all awareness. It's all awareness. Now, you always have a pen, you always have a belt, you can use a folding umbrella, you can use torches. My, one of my favorites are coin pouches. Um, I, I used to make coin pouches where you just put uh, coins in it and uh, you can swing that. But I was at the Rocks the other day, you know, uh, on the weekend, they have the Rocks markets, and they were selling pretty large kangaroo scrotums. <laughs> I bought that. <laughs> so then, it's about six inches long and it's kangaroo balls 
you put coins in that, mate, it, it makes a great stuff. However, how can that be illegal? It's a coin patch. And the thing mate. is, you put out I'm, this kangaroo skeleton and it, 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 everybody smiles and chuckles. Mate, if, if, I see a, if I see a newspaper headline saying middle-aged Asian man knocks out thief with kangaroo scrotum, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sa save that and get you to autograph it. New version of turkey slapping. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you've got that. Yes, you've got milk crates. Uh, but, okay, anything and everything can be used to protect yourself. Right? I mean, in the you know the in the in the Middle Ages, you know the, the musketeer days, they used to use their coats or their capes as they fought with swords. You see, so I mean, those were the guys that actually used it for fighting. But they used their capes, their swords. You can use your jacket. Um, my my fighting hoodies have got zip pockets because you can always put a padlock or coins in the zip pocket and start swinging that again improvised weapons I'd rather put coins in that than padlock because it's easier to, again the legalities of it uh, look anything you use you will be charged okay so just make sure that you can explain it I mean coin a coin pouch is easily explainable pen is easily explainable umbrellas but if you've got say a magazine loaded up with coins and taped up now yes it's an improvised weapon but there's in there could be intent there or premeditation there so you just got to be careful yeah that, that was always that was always my um I guess my concern about some of the tactical pens that got really popular um, was that. Uh, yeah, it, no, I don't have any of that. Yeah, yeah. no, no. It's, yeah. I mean, they're, it looks like they're, a they're illegal. They're legal, but I mean, if you're, you're carrying a pen that has Smith and Wesson on it and it's got a DNA catcher on it that to you know, scrape skin particles off, it's in court, it's going to be very hard to argue that you didn't buy that with the intention of using it as a weapon. I mean, well, it, look, all, all the prosecutor needs to do is do a, do a search on one of the ads, and guess what? It's. it's designed to hurt people yeah so, I, think, um, I think you're better off getting a nice solid pen just a regular pen that's yeah made of <laughs> made of steel and it'll do the job and it doesn't have any yeah. branding or association with it yeah clint emerson who did that book 100 100 seal tips or something like that uh, he's clint emerson 100 blah 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 he uh recommends a zebra pen which is just like a normal pen but it's kind of like a solid metal pen it looks like a pen it doesn't look like a tactical pen so that's what my guys carry the zebra pen i got yeah. off the book all right but let's 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 bring let's bring the uh the regular part of the interview to a close there because i think we've uh we've we'll, we'll whet the appetite for a return show because I, I think you and i could talk for for many more hours and uh, mm -hmm. i'm actually hoping i'll i'll catch you when you're uh your seminar tour in uh, in victoria in the middle of the year and maybe uh oh, that'd be nice maybe we'll shoot some video as well and uh, and do another part two and uh show people okay. what you're up to but um but uh yeah. <laughs> let's let's uh for people that want to know more about you uh where can they find out uh stuff about you book you for seminars all that kind of thing uh facebook is the best uh if you're on facebook raymond floro uh picture of me and my dog or email um r floro r f l o r o at loaded net Loaded is in gun, net is in fishing net. Rfloro at loadednet.com.au or you can always SMS me 0410-616-864, 0410-616-864. Don't call me. I never answer my phone, as you would know. <laughs> <laughs> very true. All right, Ray. Thank you very much for your time, mate. Uh, we'll uh, keep you on the line for a minute and we'll, uh, we'll jump over to the Patreon-only bonus questions. Thank you, sir. Okay, so Ray has uh, contacted me after we recorded the interview and asking me to if we could add something to what he said, uh, some people that he particularly wanted to thank uh, and uh, some story he particularly wanted to tell. Unfortunately, we couldn't line up times to uh, to re-record um, the, these, uh, these portions before the publish date, but uh, he has sent me through something he'd like me to read. So I'm just going to read the following. Just imagine it's coming from Ray's voice uh, because uh, he has asked me to include it. So Ray says, uh, I'd like to add that people regularly ask me how I established my niche by purely teaching weapons. It wasn't easy. And for the most part, it was trial and error, mostly error. A few defining moments happened in my journey. I've been trying to break into the market since 1987. 
but Australia at that time really looked down on weapon arts. The culture was there was no need to, at all to learn that stuff. In 1994, due to too much hard sparring, I incurred two brain hemorrhages. The second nearly killed me. Doctors said I couldn't sustain another injury like that, so I gave up martial arts completely. I was really lost then and didn't fit into the corporate world. It was Grandmaster Jeff Booth, who runs one of the most successful Hapkido schools worldwide, and who I met when I did a stint as a trainer for the Guardian Angels, who brought me back. Without him, Floro fighting systems would have disappeared into obscurity. To this day, we're still great friends. Then 9-11 happened. That altered the perception of what bladed weapons were capable of. To cut a long story short, I was then contracted by the, the US Special Forces. They flew me to Korea to teach both US and Korean Special Forces. That was the break. From there, I was contacted by Major Travis Four, who incorporated my methods into the Australian Defence Force. The Major still gets me down to teach at his gym once or twice a year. From the military, the New South Wales Police brought me, to, brought me in to incorporate my edge weapons curriculum uh, into their police college. For what, uh, but what set the formula was concentrating on the civilian market and doing seminars. I learned to appreciate that through Professor John Will. I met him the first time at the Australian Defence Force. Major Travis introduced us. He basically invited me to do a seminar at his school, and through his recommendation, other gyms and schools invited me in. I think it was Craig Donaldson at Eltham who first invited me uh, through Professor John. I've been going down to Victoria for more than a decade, and Craig has never missed booking me to teach at his school. From there, it has just grown. Ben Hamilton from Albury and Paul Veldman uh, got me in to pre present to the Victoria Police, and Paul has been instrumental in not only introducing me to more contacts, both John Will and Paul Veldman taught me how to leverage what I'm currently doing. So in a nutshell, I do a lot of private lessons, but even more seminars to earn my keep. The trend now is to conduct instructor accreditation programs, and I have Paul Veldman and, and Craig Rowbottom setting up regular sessions in that regard. So your question of the most influential people in my career, Major Travis Four. Professor John Will, Sheehan Paul Veldman. I'd also like to give a special thanks to uh, US Special Forces Jeff Guthrie, who invited me to Korea. All right, thank you once again to Mr. Raymond Floro. It was great to chat with him and uh, hear a unique story from the Australian martial arts. If you'd like to know more about Ray, follow the links or uh, look him up on social media. As he mentioned, he even gave out his phone number if you're so inclined. That's it for me. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the Managing Violence podcast. <laughs>